So today's lesson is going to be over King Ahaz of Judah. Once again, the reason why I'm emphasizing of Judah and not just of Israel is very important to today's study. Do remember after the reign of King Solomon how the nation of Israel split into two and ten tribes went to the north. They said, we'll not be under the Davidic line anymore. We'll make our own king. And then they set up Jeroboam. To rule over them and then Rehoboam though the grandson of King David the son of Solomon he ruled over Judah and as one can tell from this chart you have here on the left the kings of the southern kingdom of Judah and on the right you have the northern kings notice right here on the left Rehoboam Solomon's son and all of the Davidic line and about 200 years after the nation split, you have this King Ahaz. Notice all of the kings in green. Now that means that these kings were pretty good kings. They stuck with the Lord for the most part. They didn't turn to idol. And then all of a sudden, the worst king that the Judaite line had ever witnessed rose to power, Ahaz. A lot of Ahaz's evil has to do with this Assyrian kingdom to the north, as well as all of the surrounding nations around Jerusalem. Just to give further context as to where the nation of Judah is at politically, we must look at the two kings before Ahaz, and one of them, his grandfather, was Azariah, or better known to us as Uzziah. Now, I did an entire study already about this king Uzziah. So if you all would like to go and watch that beforehand, but just know that Ahaz is Uzziah's grandson. But then after a very long reign of 52 years, Uzziah dies and his successor is that of King Jotham. And he was 25 when he became king. He added more cities to Judah. Remember Uzziah, he loved to build. He built fortresses and towers. He was mighty because he obeyed God. He was king for 16 years in Jerusalem. And then he has his son Ahaz. 2 Kings 16 begins, In the seventeenth year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, who was the king over the northern kingdom of Israel at the time, so remember Pekah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty years old was Ahaz when he began to reign, and reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God, like David his father, meaning his great-great-great-great-grandfather hundreds of years before him, but notice this, he is 20 years old whenever he takes the throne, and he only reigns 16 years. He dies at 36, and that's a very young age, and it's tragic the way that this king reigns over Judah. King Ahaz likely, according to 2 Kings 16 and 2 Chronicles 28 accounts, began his reign by worshiping idols which caused the anger of the Lord to bring the neighboring nations against Judah. And you will see that they are attacked from all sides because of this King Ahaz's disobedience. As we are told how the king of the northern kingdom of Israel, Pekah, as well as the king of Syria, a little bit further northeast, as well as the king of Syria, rose up against Ahaz and Judah. The war began, it's believed, by most commentators, scholars, and such. The war began, it's believed, when Ahaz refused to ally with the northern kingdom and Syria against the Assyrians to the north because they're rebelling against Assyria. Israel and Syria's plan appears to have been from Isaiah 7, 5, and 6 to take the throne away. This was their plan whenever Ahaz rebelled against them. Their plan was to take the throne away from Ahaz, take him, kill him, and install a more compliant king who would join their confederacy. 
The old Bible commentators of Cambridge noted about this time, this was probably the first time that the Davidic dynasty in the southern kingdom of Judah had been menaced by a serious danger. This could actually destroy their nation. Upon hearing of Israel and Syria's alliance, the book of Isaiah, once again chapter 7, tells us how frightened Ahaz and all the people became. It was then that God commanded the prophet Isaiah to assure Ahaz not to worry concerning the alliance and to place his trust in the Lord. And I believe that whenever Ahaz began to worship all these idols, the Lord, he allowed this invasion to come upon them so strongly in order to persuade Ahaz to turn back to him as well as all the people. The prophet leaves the king with a warning that if he did not trust in God, he would be ruined. Second Chronicles 28.2 tells us how, For Ahaz walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made also molten images for Balaam. Second Kings 16.3 then tells us, But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his son, now listen to this, he made his son to pass through the fire, child sacrifice, according to the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. Now, you'll read this phrase an awful lot in Scripture, and Charles Ellicott, the old Bible commentator, he made a note on this whenever it says that they would make their sons to pass through the fire. Once again, Charles Ellicott noted, Ahaz appears to have been the first Israelite king who offered such a sacrifice as this child sacrifice. Even in the northern kingdom, because notice how it says that he walked in all the ways of the northern kingdom and made his son to pass through the fire. So he went even further than those evil kings of the north and began this child sacrifice. He no doubt regarded it as a last desperate resource against the oppression of his northern enemies. It is absurd to suppose that the king intended it in love to his child, as some would argue. Such dreadful sacrifices were only made in cases of dire extremity. Leviticus 18.21 actually tells us who they were sacrificing to. The expression to make pass through the fire to Moloch may have originated in the idea that the burning was a kind of passage to union with the deity after the dross of the flesh had been purged away, or it may be a mere euphemism. Either way, it's very much child sacrifice. 2 Chronicles 28.3 then continues, Moreover, Ahaz burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom. and burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Here's the more plural form, so we know that it wasn't just once that he did this. He sacrificed his children, not all of them, of course, but he sacrificed more than one. And he sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Now you may be wondering to yourself, why is he turning just evil all of a sudden? Well, we'll realize that it's out of sheer desperation right here in just a moment because it says that he looked at these victorious nations over him and he said, well, because Syria's God is giving them victory, I'll worship him. Whatever nation's God was giving them victory as far as he's saying, whatever nation's God was giving them victory, he would try to worship. But quickly give notice how King Ahaz would worship in these high places in Judah. Well, other kings had allowed the people to do this before, which was a blemish upon their reigns, mind you, because all people were to worship at Solomon's temple. The Lord said, no, all of you meet me. I am one God. Do not go to any other altar. Come here in this one specific place to worship me, which was located in Jerusalem. But the people, they would keep these old ancient altars that their forefathers had worshipped God at, and they would go to these. Well, other kings had allowed this, but there's a difference during the time of King Ahaz, and Albert Barnes, the old Bible commentator, he made note on this. Other kings of Judah had allowed their people to do so. Ahaz was the first, so far as we know, to countenance the practice by his own example. This was the king leading in the worship. It's then that we read in the Chronicles account how God, as a result of Ahaz turning to idolatry, 
rendered him over to the northern kingdom and Syria once that they did attack, resulting in 120,000 Judaite warriors being slain in one day. But not only that, we also read in verse 7, And Zikri, a mighty man of Ephraim, the northern kingdom of Israel, Israel was often called Ephraim because Ephraim was the largest tribe among them, Zikri, this mighty man of Israel, slew Maasiah, the king's son. So the king's son also died, and he's many of them are already dead because he's sacrificing them to Moloch. And Israkam, the governor of the house, and Elkanah that was next to the king, meaning his right-hand man, the governor of his house, so many are being killed around him. But it just gets worse and worse for Judah under the reign of Ahaz. 2 Kings 16.6 tells us, At that time Rezin, king of Syria, recovered Elath to Syria and drave the Jews from Elath. And the Syrians came to Elath and dwelt there unto this day. Now, the reason this is being noted is because at that time simply assigns this war as the epoch when Judah lost its only harbor and chief emporium, a grave blow to the national prosperity. So their cash cow, that of Elat, this port city, if you will, that was taken from them. But I agree with Charles Ellicott and that there's something probably even more dire being noted right here because notice once again how Elath is located around Edom. Rezin, the king of Syria, emancipated the Edomites from the yoke of Judah imposed on them by Uzziah, his grandfather, in order to win their active cooperation against Judah. So once again, all the nations are turning on Judah. Just as Second Chronicles 28 later on tells us, how Edom, as well as the Philistines to their west, attacked Judah at that time as well, so being surrounded. We're then told how Ahaz took all the treasures from Solomon's temple, as well as his own palace, and sent them to Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, requesting his assistance. And the king of Assyria hearkened unto him, at least for that time. For the king of Assyria went up against Damascus, Syria, and took it, and carried the people of it captive to Kerr, and slew Rezin, the king of Syria. King Ahaz, then seeing that Syria is no longer a problem for him, he travels to Damascus, the capital of Syria, to meet Tiglath-Pileser, the king of Assyria, and saw an altar that was at Damascus. Now just listen to this, how corrupt that this king is. And he saw an altar that was there at Damascus, and King Ahaz sent to Urijah the priest back in Judah the fashion of the altar and the pattern of it according to all the workmanship thereof. And when the king was come from Damascus, the king saw the altar, and the king approached to the altar and offered thereon on this pagan altar. And he brought also the brazen altar, which was before the Lord, Solomon's temple, this brazen altar that was before the Lord, he brought it from the forefront of the house, from between the altar and the house of the Lord, and put it on the north side of the altar. So he would have scooted it, or had it moved away from being the centerpiece, and then he would have moved this pagan altar in its place. And it would be upon this pagan altar that he would order all the sacrifices to transpire. But he would also leave the original altar unto the true God, he would leave that for guidance of sort. He was totally corrupt. Verse 17 then tells us, And King Ahaz cut off the borders of the bases and removed the labor from off them and took down the sea from off the brazen oxen that were under it and put it upon the pavement of stones. Now you may be asking, what's he doing? Well, he's stripping the temple in order to give all of these treasures unto the king of Assyria, because he now he's indebted to this evil king. Ahaz spoiled the temple of its ornamental work, not out of wanton malice. This wasn't just because he was evil, but from dire necessity. He had to provide a present for the king of Assyria. Second Chronicles 28, 21 then goes on to tell us how Ahaz took away a portion out of the house of the Lord and out of the house of the king and of the princes, and gave it unto the king of Assyria. Now listen to this. But the king of Assyria helped him not. Now what does this mean? Well, the commentators believe this to mean that Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, did not help him to recover the cities which the Philistines had taken from him in the south part of Judah, nor did he lend him any forces or enable him to recruit his own. 
we'll learn how this was just a strategic move on a serious part to take down one of their rebellious rivals, which was Syria. And they said, well, we might as well take money from Judah while we're at it. So all they're doing, and we'll realize this with the very next study on Hezekiah, we'll realize that what Assyria is doing is they're just encroaching to take over Judah as well. Second Chronicles 28, 24 then continues, And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God and shut up the doors of the house of the Lord restricted all worship to the true God in Jerusalem, and he made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem. It's fully believed that he's capitulating to the Assyrian kingdom now. And in the time of his distress did he trespass yet more against the Lord. This is that King Gahaz. For he sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, Syria, which smote him, and he said, Because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, Therefore will I sacrifice to them, that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and of all Israel. And Ahaz slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city, even in Jerusalem. But they brought him not into the sepulchres of the kings of Israel. And Hezekiah his son reigned in his stead. Notice his burial was not that of the kingly traditional burial, because he they brought him not into the sepulchres of the kings of Israel. He was not worthy to be a king within Israel. We're also not told how he died, nor that he repented. The successor of Ahaz would be his son Hezekiah, who would be one of the best kings of Judah, as well as one of the most tested, because his father and his horrible decisions of helping the Assyrians to become stronger and stronger would really set him up to be tested far more so, in my opinion, than his father ever was. Let us also not forget how the grandson of Ahaz would be Manasseh, in whom many regard to be the most evil king of all the kings, even worse than Ahaz, mainly due to his longer reign. He reigned longer than any of the other kings of all Israel and Judah. So that's the reason why we assign him as the, the worst of the worst. But notice how right in between these two, Ahaz and Manasseh, the two of the worst kings, both practice child sacrifice, both just evil to the core. I've already made another video on Manasseh. But notice how right in between them is dear Hezekiah whom is one of the greatest kings since David. One of the greatest kings ever is King Hezekiah. But for closing notes, we do have archaeological evidence of this King Ahaz. In 1995, a bulla, a clay seal impression, dating to this 8th century BC, during the reign of Ahaz, this was found. It contains a Hebrew inscription set on three lines, which reads, Belonging to Ahaz, son of Yehotam, king of judah a fingerprint is on the left edge of the bulla which may belong to king ahaz himself there has also been this clay tablet unearthed in 1873 which originated all the way back in the time of tiglath pileser the third in whom ahaz paid tribute to and the tribute itself is noted on this tablet and affirms this same ahaz this tablet lists a group of kings among the kings listed is Jehoaz the Judahite, 